I'm a real deal. I'll shoot your liver out and hand it to you. Yay. Rob, you look so happy. Live. I always like to start the lives talking to Rob because he gets so excited whenever we get live, and I just feel like he's got <laughs> so much energy to get started. It makes me happy to talk to him. <laughs> well, Nate, it's, it's, it's you. That's what it is. It's all you, buddy. Right from it's the me? word go. Yes. Oh, what a sweetie you are. Call. What a sweetie. Yeah, when you're like, who the heck is this kid, right? Uh Well, what's going on, everyone? As you can see, we have up in the – I'm going to go Brady Bunch style. Ready for this? Let me get limbered up. All right, straight above, we got Mike Pinoza. What's up, Mike? How you doing? Doing well. Over here, we got Demetrius. My fingers are wrong way. Yeah, it's super confusing, right? How you doing, Nate? (laughs) Straight to the left. Mike Howerton, and bringing up the bottom, we got Rob Hovick. What's up, Rob? Good day, everybody. I'm really good at pointing. I'm going to get good at this someday. I don't know when, but I'm going to get good at this someday. So I think, Mike, you've been on the podcast before talking to me. (laughs) Um, I think we did two episodes together, if I'm not mistaken. I think I brought you on twice, I think. But uh, for anybody... For anybody who hasn't heard of you or uh, knows your work in the industry, why don't you give a quick plug for yourself? Oh, I don't know about plugging myself, but I've been uh, the editor of Billiards Digest for 41 years. Um, so I've seen seen a little bit of pool in my day and uh, um, you know, enjoyed as much today as I've enjoyed it 40, 41 years ago. Got you. All right. So we're going to be talking lots of pool today. Uh, we're going to so, be talking about the so big that time. Means you started doing that when you were 10. <laughs> <laughs> no. it's only job, it's, honestly, it's the only job I've had out of college. So I came here right from college as a journalism major and uh, got a job with this magazine and uh, fell in love with the billiard business and pool players and just never left. So wait, were, were you a pool player before you got the job? Not at all. Not at all. Still, wow. not, still not a pool player, really. Uh, no, I was just a uh, journalism major looking for a job and found this magazine company who was looking for an editor and lied my way through the interview, mispronounced Willie Hoppy's name, and uh, <laughs> some of those, some of others still got my – I think I just said Willie Hopp. Uh, some of oh. others still got the job, so been here <laughs> since. Not bad. So now you're going to – are you going to take those those – base of skills that you have at lying and lie your way through this podcast? Probably. <laughs> I'm sure I'll mispronounce someone's name. There were too many Polish players in the world championship. For me to oh, hit. man. <laughs> and he could be, uh, uh, Mike Pinoza, president 24. <laughs> anyway. All right. So, yeah, there are, man, it, isn't it crazy how strong Poland is? Just, I mean, looking at that, they're, the Polish players are sick. It's gross how good those guys play. Yeah, they're really, uh, you know, top to bottom. They're probably the best group in Europe. You know, if you get to, you go through like the Euro Tour rankings and just, you know, add up points based on ranking, the top five players in Poland would have the highest combined ranking. Uh, The thing is, they just don't have that number one guy. They don't have that tournament. They're always in that, you know, four to 12 range. Uh, a couple of them, and uh, it didn't surprise me at all that all nine of them made the final 64. But then it didn't surprise me again when half of them were out when it went to 32. So um, just a lot of talent there. They just need uh, to get out there on the international stage a little bit more and compete a little bit harder. And uh, once you know, once they start winning trophies, it's going to be hard to stop those guys. Yeah, I think so too. And I, I think uh, the top three, I think it's always going to have to go to Austria, I think. But the top five on, I think, goes to Poland. Up from like five to two hundred, I think it's got to go to Poland. So, all right, well, let's jump into this. And uh, Mike and Demetrius, you guys were not on the podcast last week, so why don't you guys give your thoughts on the World Pool Championship? And we can start with uh, Demetrius. We'll start with you. Give us your overall thoughts on the event and uh, any any storylines you want to highlight along the way. 
Uh, just a couple. Thanks, Nate. Uh, you know, I think that, first of all, I mean, congratulations to Elvin. Uh, you know, winning the world championship, you know, it's one of those things that looks almost impossible. You see all those names, and how does anybody get to the finals and win it? And he's done it twice now and at a, at a fairly young age. And what a what a tremendous player. What, one of the things I like about Elvin is that there's no one part of his game that's, that's uh, you know, so noticeable where he doesn't shoot – you know, I mean, how do you shoot straighter than Shaw or Filler? And, you know, his, but, but it's just, he strikes clean. He's, his patterns are clean. Uh, he game manages extremely well. His safeties are very good. He breaks well. He's just very proficient in every part of the game with a good mental game, and he puts it together. Uh, it just looks like the way pool should be played, and he deserves it. And so, I mean, here's a title so hard to win. Shane's never won it, and he's done it twice now, and just, uh, you know, Really, really remarkable. With all the great champions, it's easy to overlook him in, in favor of people that are flashy or very, very domineering. But but uh, what a great player. So congratulations to Elvin is my first point. The second point is Omar El Shaheen to get to the finals. Uh, I knew it. I played him at Derby. I guess it's been a little over a year now ago. And uh, I remember I'd never seen him play up close before. And sitting there and watching him even just warm up, I remember thinking this guy is just an elite striker. And I think he's proved that. And he's uh, – you know, he's done some tremendous things in the, on the table, and now I think he's got everyone's attention. So what I want to do real quick with Omar is plug. There's a cool match coming up August 3rd to 5th. August 3rd to August 5th, he is going to be playing a race to 100 against Oscar Dominguez, which right now it's hard to, you know, hard to think that Oscar is going to be competitive, except that Oscar is going to be playing. They're going to be playing at hard times on Oscar's home tables, with somewhat tight pockets and gritty cloth. So it's going to favor a little bit more moving, a little bit more, you know, uh, maneuvering maybe. And Oscar's a very good grappler, and he plays very good on those tables. He's beaten a lot of great players on those tables. So that's going to be coming up between August 3rd to August 5th, Oscar Dominguez versus Omar El Shaheen on Aaron's Pool Parlor. So if you haven't already followed uh, Aaron Taylor, Aaron's Pool Parlor, look that up on Facebook and follow it now so that you can uh, you can watch that stream. And then uh, the only other thing that I think is interesting uh, that I, well, that's, no, there's a lot of interesting things. The only other thing I think is pertinent is uh, I think what it gets to Shane, but I'll, I'll save those comments to when we start talking a little bit more about uh, where Shane's at uh, with, uh, with the other events that he's played and are coming up. Yep. And Mike, what you got? Oh, we can't hear you anymore. We lost your audio. First rodeo? No, I was on my – can you hear me now? Yeah, you good. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. It's kind of gone – the audio and the hearing has gone off a couple times. I'm not sure why. But um, I just thought, you know, kudos to Matchroom for putting together, uh, I think, one of their best tournaments. I thought it looked great. I thought it ran great, um, you know, given the circumstances – I thought they did a great job. Um, you know, I, I will always, you know, have my thought will always be that this was not the world championship field that we should have had, but that's not really their fault. Um, there are a lot of people in the field who just shouldn't be in a world championship. Uh, takes nothing away with what Alvin did in winning. It's a, it's a really difficult tournament to win, uh, especially when it goes to single elimination all the way from 64 on in. You just can't make a mistake. And Albin is most dangerous when he loses early in a double elimination situation or a multi, you know, loss format. Uh, he did the same thing at the uh, Championship League pool event. Um, you know, he does that, and he did it here where he lost early to Roberto and then just buckled down, and then he just doesn't give in. He's such a great player. Uh, and what Demetrius said was was spot on. He just doesn't make a lot of mistakes. He doesn't take chances when other players will, um, and uh, he just he just knows how to stay in the game. Uh, great, great tournament for him. Obviously, great tournament for Omar, and anybody who's ever met Omar couldn't be happier that, that he did that well. Um, always cool to see someone like Oliver pop in, you know, as a complete unknown and uh and make the final four so it was it was really a fun tournament to watch i thought they did a really great job with it and yeah for alvin you know he's won world championship twice and he was in the finals a third time so um you know that's that's a pretty good career as far as shane goes 
Shane has not won a world championship. I don't think that defines his career one way or another um, because at the end of the day, the world championship is a great title and it's a great name. Um, you know, it's as far as difficulty of winning, it's really not much different than the historical value of the U.S. Open wins. And Shane's got five of those. So, um, uh, yeah, those are my thoughts on the world championship. Yeah, and uh, I, I guess we're, we're kind of getting to the point now where they're making some announcements about the Moscone Cup. And how much trouble are we in as, a, as, a, as the U.S.? <laughs> how much trouble do you guys think that we're in when <laughs> players like Oliver are coming out, people you've never even heard of before? Well, and you have th- stuff like that come out. And then, and then you hear people from like, like uh, Mika Eminen told, you know, he came onto my podcast. That episode will drop pretty soon too. But he's like, yeah, that guy's, you know, you know flip a coin and there's, there's you know, 50,000 other people just like that kid right there in Europe that are coming up that you've never heard of. And it's like, whoa. <laughs> well, my- but it's been that way for a while in Europe and it'll be that way continuing. The, the, the thing is, Moscone Cup – they may be 60 players deep, 70 players deep, but unless it's a 60 player tournament, it still only matters if you've got five guys who can match up with their top five guys and, you know, we'll be the underdog for years and years to come, but it's still going to be five guys racing to five. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not insurmountable. We showed that two years in a row when we were a heavy underdog two years in a row. So um, it's just, how are you playing when the, when the, when the ball drops and uh, and you get a couple of rolls, you get on a little bit of momentum, and you know our top five guys can play race to five with anybody in the world. You know they might not be favored in a lot of them, but can they win sets? Mm-hmm. Of course. So the Moscone Cup, you know, is, we're, we're going to be underdogs for a long time, but it's not insurmountable because it's still only five guys. Yep, agreed. All right. Well, does uh, anybody else have any uh, any thoughts on the World Pool Championships before we move on to? Uh... I guess the big time classic. No. All right. Well then let's, let's start talking about the big time classic. We'll talk about the one pocket first and uh, a little bit of a surprise, I guess, uh, Carlo Beato double dips, Josh Roberts in the finals. Um, I mean, I knew Carlo dabbled a little bit with one pocket, but I, I certainly didn't think he was going to be a favorite in this field. Uh, looking across the field, some of the top players, I mean, Alex Peggy Lyon played in this. Of course, Josh Roberts was in there. Who else? We have Dennis Arcoyo, Alex Calderon, um, Warren Kiamko. Uh, yeah, I mean, those are some of the top names in this. I mean, this is a real, real one pocket field. And I mean, the the thing that I noticed first, and I'm just going to throw my opinion out there, and we'll discuss this because I don't know. I just I'm the person talking. This is how many tournaments in a row that uh, Alex has not even really made the final. He hasn't even made the money in this. Right. Let's see where where did he finish up actually? Cash. Okay, so fifth six. So fifth six caches in this tournament. Yeah. So then he was one into the money on it. I mean, why? What's going on with Alex? I mean, he's he's pretty much he decided the best one pocket you know player in the world and has been for what ten fifteen years something like that. It's been a while, um, and he he's not even he he can't win any of these smaller tournaments or really make deep runs in it. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I, okay, I'll jump in. I think that Alex, he's he's always been one of my favorite players. Uh, I, I think he was at the top of pool for 10, 10, 15 years, and he still is a phenomenal player. But when you come to when you come to winning against the best players in the world in any discipline, I, I think you can't you can't be wounded in any way. Uh, you have to be firing on all cylinders in terms of striking, in terms of confidence, uh, and just in terms of, you know, internal. I mean, he's never struggled about belief, but it's clear that, uh, you know, we're talking about Poland. We're talking about the, what, what the players of today are doing. It's clear that for the last few years, uh, you know, his his rotation game is just a hair off of where it was at his peak and uh, at a time when everybody else is actually getting better. So so he's we've seen it when he played. Uh, you know, that match against Kachi, we've seen, we've seen how he stacks up against, you know, just whatever it is. And it, and I think that knowing, just kind of knowing that he's been eclipsed a little bit on the striking and, and just a little bit 
he's just not top tier anymore. And so when you're not, well, I shouldn't say that I, he's not at the top of the world anymore. And and so for all those years that everyone's like, Oh, he's the best one pocket player in the world. And I'm still not going to argue with that, but that was while his confidence was like, I'm the best pool player in the world. You know, Shane was the best and I'll follow him around and gamble with him anytime and show me a player. I'm not saying I'm the best, but show me a player that could beat me and I'll play them and whatever. And it's like, and I just feel like once that's gone, that magical, I'm the best is gone. I, and, and he's just been a hair, just a hair off of his superhuman level. I just feel like he's a little bit wounded and you can still, he can still play great and he can still win. And maybe in a long money match where he knows that he's got time to get in stroke and outmaneuver these guys, maybe he could, he could get there with anybody, but, but it's just, it's in a short set against top players. He's a little vulnerable. And I think that that, uh, I think just, just, I think when you're a little bit wounded, you can't limp around it. The fields have gotten too strong and, and those types of things get exposed and strange situations, you know, just those make or break going for the spot shot off the end rail and those little situations where you get tested. He just doesn't pass the test all the time. And he used to pass that test all the time. And now he's passing it a lot of the time, but he's just a little bit more vulnerable. I think that he used to be. And, uh, Mike Cowerton, I know you're uh, not the biggest fan of one pocket, so we'll hold off on you probably until. Uh... <laughs> Rob, Rob, you have any uh, any thoughts on it? Uh, I'm going to treat this like an AA meeting and just pass this time. Okay, no problem. Well, uh, I guess talking about uh, the overall event, then um, Carlo Beato beats Josh Roberts in the finals. Uh, that's a great tournament for Josh. I mean, this is a strong field. Josh has always been one of my, I, I would say, I think Josh Roberts is one of the most underrated players in the entire country. Uh, him and Oscar Dominguez, I think, kind of take that role for me. The dude is really, really strong. And I think he, I think it's because we don't really see him playing in these big national events like the World Pool Championships or, you know, other events overseas, the the big ones, that I think he kind of just kind of floats under the radar. But the guy's a great player, and he's a great one-pocket player, too. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily surprise me that he's up at the top. And I mean, I guess Carlo Beato, he's, he's just such a talent, right? That, I mean, he can get there playing anything. I mean, he could probably jump into a snooker event and, you know, have success potentially with, with how good of a QST he is. Um, so I, I guess, does anybody have any thoughts on the, the finals there or either of these players doing well in it? Mike, anything? Uh, well, yeah, I think, you know, uh, you know, Josh Roberts, a lot, he's been, you know, the talk of a lot of people in the last couple of years, even when they talk about, you know, players that could eventually work into a Moscone Cup role, um, you know, but he does, you know, need to be in more of the big events more often to see how he does in those against the top players in a continual basis. And, um, you know, he needs to show that a little bit more. He certainly has the talent. You know, you see it in a lot of these these smaller tournaments, regional tournaments, gambling matches. Uh, but you know, I'd like to see him, you know, try his, his his hand on the bigger stage a little more often, just to see what he can do. Uh, I don't blame him if he chooses not to do that, you know, and chooses to stick with where he's got a better chance at making money. Because for a lot of these guys, it's a living. Uh, but yeah, he's a he's a terrific player. And we were pretty close to actually getting to see a Josh Roberts versus Demetrius matchup. That would have been fun. Yeah, yeah. I was supposed to. I was down in Atlanta here about six weeks ago or a month ago, and uh, I was supposed to play him, but he uh, his plans changed at the last minute. He had to cancel on me, so I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't make my contribution to the uh, through his travel <laughs> fund. <laughs> All right. Well, let's. Uh... Let's move on from the one pocket then. That's pretty much all the thoughts I have on this one. And let's go to the ladies nine ball real quick. We'll cover this one up. Uh, this was won by Nicole Keeney. So uh, good tournament for her. Uh, Ming Nung gets second place. And let's go over to the, the B side. We have Tam Treen. Hopefully I pronounced that right. And we have in fourth place, we have Courtney Peters. So I wanted to – oh, and Kim Pierce got fifth, sixth. I, I do know who that is. She's a – actually, I'm not sure on a lot of these these women's here. But I wanted to make sure that we highlighted them. Um, anybody anybody have anything to say about that? I'm not trying to just skip over it, but I honestly am not sure of playing? a lot of these women's. Yeah, has, I, has I don't know. Playing? I haven't seen her name in, in quite some time. I haven't either, yeah. I'm not totally sure. 
Well, I know she was, well, and, and Mike's aware of this. I mean, she was one of the, the young players on the WPBA, what, seven, eight years ago. And, and she seemed like she was going to have quite a career, and then she just kind of disappeared. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. You're, you're right. It was a name that popped up a lot some years ago, uh, aspiring WPBA, and I think you know a number of those players kind of had decisions to make on how much they were going to play pool after the WPBA kind of, uh, you know, started only being able to have a tournament or two a year, and there wasn't anything sustainable there. So uh, it could have just been one of those situations where you know people have to make a decision between how much they're really going to play pool again and not. So. That's all I can think of at that point. Yeah, maybe we'll find out with this because uh, the WPBA has got an event coming up. So I guess maybe if she plays in that, then we'll have an idea that she might be back. Yeah. But that one's coming up in uh, Iowa, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yep. All right. Well, let's move on to the uh, the classic open nine ball, the big time classic open nine ball. And we are going to be, well, doesn't it seem kind of fitting that Dennis Arcoyo double dipped Shane in the finals with what we're going to be talking about afterwards and how the first match went, you know, running from behind and coming through and double dipping. I mean, it's kind of a, uh, it's almost like destiny where the first match ended up with Shane and uh, Dennis the first time Shane's up. I want to say, was it 114 or 112 to about 97, 98? And Dennis comes back and wins at 120 to 119. Seems only fitting that the double dip would happen here. But it seems, uh, certainly so, seems fitting that they would play each other in the final, and and now you know it, it sets up well for their for their head to head match. Um, so you know, just builds up a little more animosity, a little more grit, and determination. Uh, so it, it can't do anything but help the 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 one on one match. Absolutely, yeah. That's some good marketing there. So uh, Jesus Intencio gets third place. Uh, I mean, what a great tournament for him. He's, uh, he's, I mean, this dude's, everything he basically plays in now, he's he's doing really well. And I mean, he's he's coming up as like the next, uh, I, I would say, uh, American kind of superstar. Him and him and Sky, of course. Uh, I mean, he's not really American, but I, am, uh, am I wrong in saying I think he might be an American citizen now? Does anybody know? Don't know. No, I'll have to. I'll have to reach out to uh, somebody and ask them on that. His let's see. Uh, so Alex Alex Pagulain finishes fourth. Uh, Warren Kiamko and uh, Cesar Archiga gets uh, fifth, sixth. Carlo Beato, Alex Calderon finish up seventh, eighth. I mean, there's a lot of great, great players in this final event. Uh, Sky Woodward gets seventeenth through twenty fourth. I mean, that'll tell you how tough this tournament is. Josh Roberts, Justin Espinoza, Alex Calderon. Um, Keith Price is a great player. There's a lot of really, really top players in this. It, it's uh, it's good to see that uh, I guess we're having real events again, right? I mean, people are playing again, and the U.S. has kind of opened up. So, Rob, why don't you give us your thoughts uh, on the event? Anything that you, you thought was a standout or a surprise or anything? Yeah. Uh- I have a question, you know, not to change the subject because we're talking pool here. Uh, for you guys, you mentioned the Moscone Cup and, and in, in the future. And and I'd like to know what the other uh, uh, three guys here, four guys here on the show, think about who's going to be the fourth and fifth players for the United States. I mean, pretty much going to go with Shane, Billy, and Sky uh, as th- three starters. But then – Four and five, that's kind of open. And I'm, I'm just interested in what you guys here think, number four and five, who they'll be. Well, anybody want to go on first? Mike, what do you think? Mike, <laughs> uh, Mike Howerton, sorry. <laughs> My only thoughts are I'd really like to see Justin Bergman in one of those spots. but He will not be in one of those spots. Uh, then that's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that? Um, I politics just uh okay. no. <laughs> we'll have to talk off air. It's um so okay. So, yeah, I I don't know that he won't be, but I'm pretty sure he won't be. And we we can talk off air on that one because I don't exactly know, but I think I know. 
But um, yeah, I would like to see Justin as well. I would love to see Oscar and Oscar, Justin, and Tyler pick two of the three, personally. But go on, Mike. That's a, that's my my biggest. I mean, I don't know who the fourth or fifth are, and and I'm not really sure. I mean, I think if you take if you take Sky, Billy, and Shane out of the equation, then Bergman may be the top player. And I think we had success when he was playing. Um, for the fifth boy, I have no idea. Yeah. Mike Pinozzo, any thoughts? Uh, well, I, I don't, you know, I don't know what the, what the inside is on Justin Bergman, definitely not being a contender because he would have been my fourth pick, you know, guaranteed. Uh, but if he's out of the equation, yeah, I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure where I'd go. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Tyler is an obvious pick for everyone since he didn't make it last year. Uh, but Tyler hasn't really done a lot to dazzle me in the last year and a half, including the Moscone cup that we won, uh, in 19. So, um, you know, it's, it's a tough call at that point. It's going to be, uh, gut feeling on Jeremy's part, although uh, to me the really interesting addition to this equation is adding Shane as the vice captain, which is kind mm-hmm. of kind of another way of saying Shane's going to have serious impact on on who plays with him in, in London. So I think that he'll have a, a, a big influence on Jeremy's decision as, as to who to pick. Um, and I think that was part of the you know, I'm not going to say it's part of the deal of him being co-captain or vice captain, but uh, that's what I read into it. That's what I read into it too. Um, I think I said that on the podcast last week that I thought um, Shane was there because he wanted more of a role on who was going to be on the team. But um, and I reached out to Joey uh, Joey Gray and asked him, and he doesn't really know the situation what happened either. So. I'm not totally sure what happened. Um, yeah, a couple of people throwing out Mike Shane. Mike Shane's been back playing again, actually. Uh, I know he's still working full time, and <laughs> well, but uh, I don't. I don't think that he's got a ch- much of a chance of making the team either. And that one, that one is definitely politics. Yeah, I th- Mike I think laughs. If, he knows. Yeah, you know, well, I think if, Sh- if Shane's the vice captain, you know, I've got a better chance of being on the team than Mike DeShane. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. Uh, I think we've got to just start going. Uh, you know, I liked what Mashroom's been, been doing with the younger players. And, uh, you know, last year, Chris Robinson, you know, I was a big fan of Tyler at the time. But I think Chris, you know, Chris is a is a reasonable candidate. I also think Danny Olson should be somewhat talked about. Uh, you know, Danny's been playing well. And uh, and if he's given an opportunity, we don't know how well he can get playing. So I think I think in addition to Tyler, I think uh, Chris, I, I'd be more inclined to start thinking along the lines of Chris and Danny uh, and Tyler. Uh, because they're they're still on the upswing, and I think and they're and they're hungry and they're active. Mm-hmm. And I think that being being on the upswing, hungry and active means a lot. I also want to mention, uh, you know, one thing I've been really following. And so as we look forward five years of the Moscone Cup, uh, we have a lot of young talent coming up through these junior tournaments. I've been following these very closely because uh, I coach a few of them. And I'll tell you right now, the uh, there are a number of of. Uh, young players between you know 13 and 16 that are playing very very good pool right now and so um i think that that's uh that bullets well i don't think we're i, I think we've got a chance of uh raising the bar in the u.s uh here over the next five ten years yep, I, I don't disagree with that um so Rob, you haven't given us your thoughts. You asked the question. Uh, give us yeah, thoughts. One, uh, yeah, you guys mentioned the possibilities <clears throat> of these other players, sure, and and I agree with all that. Uh, but I was I was I was totally impressed at the championships this last week with uh, Jeremy Sosi's play. I, yeah, I just, that's what Laura said too. He was, just, yeah. he was just so steady, and he was so confident, and and uh, his his uh, position play. Was was just right spot on, and and he's center pocketing these balls and not cheating the pockets. Uh, I I like him because he performed so well in this last uh, big stage format, you could say, and, and was surprising. He's been around for a while, and yeah, and, well, and yeah, my question for- made it to the elite group, you know. But boy, I, I was impressed with him. I wouldn't mind seeing the, him on the team. For the two mics, has Jeremy ever been on the Moscone Cup? I don't remember him ever playing for the Moscone Cup. 
No. Um, he was a finalist a couple of the years with uh, when Mark Wilson was first uh, the captain, and he had kind of a, a bigger group that he was training, and then at the last second picking the final five. And I remember he and Brandon Schuff were the last two out uh, one of the years. Uh, but he's been up for consideration a couple times, probably not in the last three or four years. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I would agree with with uh, Robert. He he was really solid at the World Championships and didn't look intimidated, didn't look flustered, didn't you know? He he was he just was all business, and I, I was really impressed as well. Yeah, good kid too. And, yeah, did he make? Uh, he made seventeenth through. Is that right? Seventeenth through thirty first or second? Is that is that what he made? He didn't make the quarters, right? No, no, I believe it's one before the quarterfinals. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good showing for him. Uh, uh, I mean, it's pretty impressive. I think uh, I had heard of him before, of course. I'd never really seen him play much. I, whenever I do remember watching him play, I mean, he was one of the slowest players I think I've ever seen in my life. So I'm actually kind of surprised that he handled the shot clock so well. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, if, if, if that's kind of his game and he can handle that, that pressure of being in that matchroom arena, why not? He seems to be a player that could – Certainly, uh, he seems like a good calming influence, if nothing else, uh, right? I mean, it's always nice to have a calming, kind of a calming uh, person, I guess, on the team to settle everything down when you need it. We got Billy for the hype man whenever you need to get jacked up and get ready to go. <laughs> Might be a good role for him. Who knows? What do you think? What do you think, Rob? Yeah, I'd, I'd also, I, I would like to see Tyler play again. Uh, Steyer, I, I, I'm, I'm a little partial. I, I got some prejudice there, him being from Wisconsin and, and just across the block here, you know, and, and, and doing all he's doing, like Demetrius is, for the growth of the game by uh, uh, coaching mm-hmm. and starting pool uh, training centers and things like that and, and doing some things, him, him and Margaret, uh, very involved in, in younger players and the future of pool for for America, uh, so it, yeah, I, I would like to see him. But but there's there are Justin certainly is the next choice for number. Yeah, four. Just, I think Justin is the second or the third best player in the country. I think Robin so in, in there definitely. Yeah, uh, in there. Either him or Mike Deshane. I think Mike Deshane's still up there too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think that was a, a pretty good discussion on that one. Um, I guess back to the the big time classic. Is there anything that we really want to discuss on this one? Uh, that I guess does anybody have anything that they they wanted to discuss about this tournament? I see in the comments here, uh, Ben Brady just mentioned Corey Duell. Yeah. Nope. And uh, what about Carol? Sales. Carol Hardy mentioned. What about John Schmidt, Mister Six Hundred? So if they were playing straight pool. Races to five. I think he'd be an obvious choice. I just don't think he's been active on the rotation scene, and his uh, his his nine ball <laughs> game has not been has not been. You know, he hasn't been active. He just hasn't been active. Uh, I'm sorry. I just started laughing at New Jersey pool players. Or Troy's comment: <laughs> Put Sean, our team, or get to ship his ass back to Scotland. <laughs> 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 That's a great. Yeah, he's got. That a, is he's, pretty funny. He's got U.S. He's his. Pool room is even named U.S. Pool. Like, what is that? Come on, Jason. You're basically American at this point. <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> Ship is that one. <laughs> All right. Well, um, <clears throat> whew. all right. Let's get back on topic. Well, let's uh, let's just uh, look into the, the the big matchup that's coming up this weekend. Shane versus Dennis. Um, I'm going to try to give as close to a. Uh, accurate as I can five months ago description of what happened in the first match. Uh, I think it was kind of back and forth a little bit with always Shane having a little bit of a lead. Uh, Shane extends it out on the last day, gets up to as I want to say it was as high as 112 to about 96 or 97. And then uh, Dennis ends up winning, I guess uh, what, almost 30 of the, uh, 25 of the next 20 games and gets the match back to 117 to 117 and then scratches. And then I'm pretty sure that maybe it was 118 to 118 and then scratches. Shane runs the rack out and then breaks and scratches. And then Dennis runs out the last two racks. Does that sound, does that sound pretty close to accurate? Yep. Anybody? Okay. So 
so that the match finishes up in a race to 120. It was deemed as the, the best pool match in history, and this is the rematch of it. Dennis Arcoyo wins 120 to 119. I personally have never seen any race that long go hill hill, and now we're running it back. We'll start with uh, we'll start with Mike Howerton. What do you think on what do you think as far as the run back? What do you think is going to happen? You know, it doesn't feel like this match has been getting the the kind of PR that you would expect it to get. Um, you know, it, it's kind of crept up on on us. I mean, it's easy to say to say that Shane wins this one, but I still think Dennis is going to be a small favorite. Maybe, you know, I don't know that I'd give uh, 10 racks, but, you know, I, I think Dennis is going to be a small favorite. And, and I'd like to come back after everybody gives their opinions and talk a little bit more about Dennis. You got it. All right, Mike Pinozo, what do you got? Uh, well... <laughs> Sequels just never seem to be as good as the original. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I don't see anybody running away with this, but I don't think it's going to have the drama that the, that the first one did. It, it, it almost can't possibly have the drama that the first one did. Um, I'd be, I'd be hard pressed to find a storyline that's better than the first. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, you know, I don't think that means it's going to be disappointing and I don't know which side I would pick to win. I just don't think it's going to have the same, uh, edge of their seat, everybody watching as the first one did. Um, but you know, it's still going to be it's still going to be a great match. I mean, I I would think I would I would favor Shane in it. Uh, but you know, Shane gets ahead and gets a lead. You can't tell me that that Dennis wouldn't be in the back of his head uh, as far as you know. I don't care what your lead is, I can make it up. So. Um, you know, it, it'll be interesting. It'll be fun to watch. Uh, but like I said, sequels very rarely measure up. Yeah. Rob, what you got? I think it's going to be pretty darn exciting. Uh, <laughs> maybe beating the first matchup. Possibly Dennis is ahead by 15 games going into the last five. And uh, Mr. Van Boning comes back from nowhere. Uh, yeah, I, 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 it's got potential. I don't see the hype, like Mike says, but uh, it, it, it's, it's going to be good. There, there's no question about it. These are two premier play, pool players, button heads for the second time, plus other events, uh, tournament events that things have happened between these two. So I'm looking forward to it for sure. And, on, and I, on, every, on every great show, you got to have a hype man. That's clearly Rob, and you got to have a, a reality man, and that's clearly uh, that's clearly Mike. You know? <laughs> this event's gonna suck. This event's Mike, gonna be great. This event's gonna suck. This event's gonna yeah. be great. <laughs> Mike and reality are very very rarely words used in the same sentence. <laughs> Demi, what you got? Yeah, this one is. I think it's gonna be a very very hard to call match. Um, I'm, I've been stewing on it, and I think that it pains me to say this, but I think I might have to give a slight edge to Dennis. Uh, I think what we've got going for us is last time around, I, I kind of felt like, well, if they play 10 ball, Shane's gear and his break are just completely dominant. And so going in, we were really curious, like, how is, is Shane going to have a breaking advantage playing nine ball with a three-point rule, nine on the spot? And I think the way he was able to accumulate the lead he did was that he was out breaking Dennis in the first half of that match. Dennis got that break working and was able to hang with him. And, of course, he needed Shane to let him back into the match, but then he took advantage. This time around, I'm trying to figure out where the advantage is for Shane. Uh, Dennis, I think, has that break going just as well as Shane does. And when it comes to kind of what I was saying about Alex, I've really been thinking about this. Shane has been really trying to rally his career. And, again, in a, in a similar way to Alex, he's been playing phenomenal. You know, getting to the finals of this uh, last tournament, you know, winning national level events like Turning Stone, and he's always plays good. But there's little things that I see in Shane's game where it's like he keeps trying to rally, but it's he's not quite where he where it was. So, for example, when he was playing this uh, World Championship, you know, I, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I watched that match he lost. Uh, to Oliver. And there's just little things like he'll come with a hard shot and he'll get down on the ball and get off the ball and chalk and kind of get ready to fight. 
He'll make the shot, and then he'll end up. He ended up on the end rail where he's a little awkward leg at this ball on the side, and it's like he's irritated that he ended up like, "Hey, man, I made that good shot. I should have something better than this." And he, did, you know, he got down, and you could tell he should have gotten off that ball too, but he just wasn't ready to grind in that second ball to roll. And he kind of missed it and was kind of disgusted at what the, the way the balls were working. Meanwhile, these young guys are just like, "Let me add a piece of the ball, and I'll shoot it in." And I see this kind of leaking out into Shane's game. Now, Shane's career is really interesting because. He used to play like an 07, 08. He was more game management controlling. And then and then he started playing so good, he kind of caught a gear and was just like making a few more unforced errors, but he was catching gears nobody could hang with. The problem right now is he can't catch those gears in nine ball because of the nature of the randomness of that nine on the spot break. And so he can't ever really get that big gear going where he's putting these huge packages together any more than Dennis can. And so he can't, he can no longer afford to leak off these opportunities. And so in the end, I feel like Dennis has neutralized the break. And I feel like Shane hasn't quite neutralized some of those, those in between moving and kind of clutch situations. I just, I, Shane can definitely win. It's hard to bet against a guy that got a big lead last time. But I think at this point, I think it's a pretty even match. And I think Dennis is more connected. So this is uh, this is how you can tell that Demetrius and I have not talked for a long time, right here, because I think you are so wrong, Demetrius. I, 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 I when we went into this when we went into this first match, we were on the same exact page. We we're, were like, ah, I'm pretty sure Shane's gonna win nine on the spot. It's a little goofy. Who really knows? Uh, you know. All right, we're gonna go with Shane. Let's lose some money, right? We both kind of just settled on Shane, and that's kind of where we are at. I am so deep into the Shane bandwagon here. It's not even funny. <laughs> when they played the first time, Shane was off the lake hitting balls for two weeks. I mean, he had literally just came off of the lake and said, hey, oh, yeah, that's right. I got this matchup. Let me go hit a couple balls this this week, and let's see what happens. He is now coming off of the Whirlpool Masters, the Whirlpool Championships. Uh, in the Whirlpool Championships, there was not a player in that field, and Albin said it himself when on our interview yesterday. There was not a player in that field that could have beaten Shane. The only person that could have beaten that Shane is the tur- tournament organizers by changing the racking pattern. If you kept that template rack, nobody in the world was going to beat Shane. I don't like he's breaking the ball so good. He's controlling his one ball so well. Yes, that's one on the spot. That's different. This is nine on the spot. A little bit different. But Shane is so in tune with his break at this point. There was not a. I mean, he made Jason Shaw just look like, just I mean, look like he didn't even belong in the same country. And Shane, I mean, Jason is such a great player, and Shane was just running through everybody in that tournament. Shane is coming in in his top gear, his top, top gear, and it's going to take something weird to even have him not win the world championships, and that was, you know, changing the racks. I think Shane isn't going to run through Dennis by any stretch of the imagination. Dennis is still a great player, but I, I feel exponentially more confident in this one than I did the last one. Shane's well, me- hungry. Let me Go ask ahead. you a question about that. Let me ask you a question. You, by the way, you mentioned that the only thing that could beat Shane is the rack change. I mean, I would also include Shane himself. I mean, he yep. he he let himself get beat last time, and and if you watch that match, they lost to Oliver. Yeah, the rack made a role in that, but he had chances to win for sure. He had chances to win, and he yep. just wasn't ready to do it. So you know, that's the question. So my question to you then is. You're talking that he's probably going to have a breaking advantage. What if would you would do you feel that Shane needs a breaking advantage against Dennis in that format to win, or do you feel that if Dennis could break as well as him, do, who do you think wins? I, I think uh, I think it's a fair question, and um, what I would say is I don't think Shane was at his peak game when they played the first time. You can, you can't tell me that. I don't care if you I don't care if you've been playing the game for 30 years as the best in the world. You need more than two weeks on a lake to compete against who many would argue is the straightest shooter this game has ever seen, right? You need more than two weeks off of a lake, hitting balls around in your basement on live Facebook video to get yourself properly prepared to play against one of the world's best players ever. <clears throat> Shane has been playing nonstop now, basically since the end of April. And he's if he's not in his peak, he never will be. I mean, as far as what his game can do right now, I think his game is there, and it has been there, and I think it was. I think it was shown pretty clearly in the uh, the Whirlpool Championships, where he was just mowing through everybody. I mean, like you said, the, another person that could beat Shane is himself. You're right, well, Shane. You know that 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 switch on the rack that that messed with him. I think it really messed with him. 
Go I ahead. think that I think that he's really you're right like he's mowing people down and I think that when he's able to get his gear going and make it like who can run the fastest I think he's a great high gear player that can run people down but what I would say is is that he's and I would agree he's at the top of his game physically when it comes to catching big gears and he can at any point he can run a package that's so big that's so well played that you're like nobody can play that good but if the format is such that it's hard to control the break with the nine of the spot and Dennis is fighting back and, and landing packages back at him when he's playing hard. If it comes to a like a who has the more grit to, you know, to regroup and, and make smaller unforced errors. I just feel like if it's a high gear contest, nobody can ever keep up with Shane. Uh, but while he's playing the best pool of his life physically, I'm not completely convinced he's playing the best pool of his life in terms of the grit it needs to uh to, to fight for those in between racks that you need to get going to give yourself a chance to get that momentum. And I, and here's the thing. I hope I'm wrong. I'm, I'm always rooting for Shane to make the comeback and launch the second. You know, I'd love to see him have another five, 10 years of complete dominance. Uh, I've been rooting for it. I've been rooting for it. I just haven't seen it yet. Yep. I think, uh, I think the first time when they played Dennis was at the best form of his, maybe of his life. I mean, the way that Dennis was playing when they went into that first matchup, he can't, he can't rise above that. I mean, that's, that's the best I think that Dennis can play given his breaking disadvantage or his breaking problems. I don't think Dennis can shoot the ball straighter than he was then. I don't see him at that spot right now. And I do see Shane significantly higher than where he was uh, going into that first matchup. So I think, I think this is actually, I'm not going to say Shane's going to cruise to a win, but I think, I think Shane should be a huge favorite. Uh, I guess let's, what do you think about Dennis? I was just going to ask you about Dennis because there's a comment about how Dennis is a little off his game. The only thing I, I thought Dennis played inspired against uh, Skyler, but of course that's bar table. What mm-hmm. do you, where do you think Dennis is right now? I, I, I don't think that he's where he was. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know exactly where he's at as far as, but the way that the, the game that I saw out of Dennis when they played the first time was the best I've ever seen the guy play. And you're talking about already maybe one of the top five players to ever touch a pool cue. I, and I, that was about the best I've seen him play. Like he was playing all the time during COVID. I mean, he was he was literally firing every single day for six, seven, eight hours, and he was hitting the balls extremely good. I don't see that now. He was dominating even all like the little regional events that they were having at the time. Any tournament he could find, he basically won everything for like a four month stretch. We haven't seen him win a tournament now, except for this one. <laughs> I was just gonna say, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Since uh, when was the last time we saw Dennis up at the top of? maybe a couple months, maybe a month, maybe a month and a half. Um, I think it was the Florida tournament that where he swept the tournament, I think was the last time we saw him win. Um, and I'm not saying that Dennis isn't a great player anymore. I mean, that's stupid, but um, I just don't think he's quite at the level he was the first time that they played. Well, I and think it's going to be a fun match, fun match to watch oh, yeah. for sure. Fun match to and watch. He, so Mike, Mike, Rob, listen to us having that little uh, debate there. Would it, anything come to mind for you guys? Well, the first thing I thought it was if, if you know, if, if Dennis had slip at all and whatever, uh, you know, the mental shot of adrenaline that he got by beating Shane twice at big time uh, just, you know, had to help him. And you wonder what kind of little gremlins it puts in Shane's head. Uh, that's the only thing that I would, that I would add to the equation at this point. Maybe the last little uh, shot before you get into the, uh, the match messing yeah. with the head a little bit. Yeah, it could be. Mike yeah, again, it might be it might be the part where uh, where Bruce Lee gets hit and starts you know bleeding and it might just make Shane mad. You never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After listening to well, you, you and Demetrius go at it here, uh, I, I'm I'm convinced that Demetrius could have been the best used car salesman in the United States <laughs> <laughs> uh, because he could talk me in you know a, just a a dog I don't want. I, I, uh, thank, thank, you. Good, thank you, Rob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought that wasn't going to be a compliment in the beginning, but I think it is now. Well, <laughs> if, if you take and break, I mean, if you were to break pool matches down into uh, their their smallest particles and their smallest pieces, like busting the, the atom, of, you know, I think Demetrius was the person to talk to, put it all out and put it together again. It just makes so much sense when it comes to pool and, and and the players that that play the game, and so do you, Nate. Uh, uh, I'm not taking anything away. It's just uh, it's kind of an unfair fight, I think. When you two, I'll be a rebound compliment. That's fine. 
<laughs> Jesus, uh, making all kinds of friends. <laughs> how do I how do I mute Rob on this? Uh, yeah, I am not on here to be your friend. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Uh, Mike Howerton, you have any thoughts on it? Uh, no, I still feel the same way that I did. Um, I had mentioned that I wanted to, to circle back around to Dennis. You know, it, it really occurred to me the last couple of weeks how long he's been a dominant part of the game. Yeah. Our, and, and again, I, I kind of target this to Mike Pinoza. I think he would be the, the person to answer this the, the best. Is Dennis, is Dennis the modern-day Ephraim? <clears throat> And is Dennis and Shane's rivalry the modern day Efren and Earl rivalry? You're muted again. I would say I would say no and no. (laughs) Um, I don't think that Dennis is even in a conversation with Efren uh, as far as, you know, historic significance and and level of play and impact on the game. Um, Dennis is, you know amazingly strong mental player and a great shooter and, um, you know, is all heart, no doubt about it. But uh, he doesn't have, to me, nearly the track record that Efren had. As far as their head-to-head, you know, head-to-head, I don't remember that many tournaments where Shane and Dennis played in the final. And to me, that's, that's what rivalries are. That's, you know, that's Earl and, you know, Earl and Efren and, you know, Siegel and Varner. And, you know, you're talking about different matchups there. So so I would say, you know, at that level, not the same. Uh, not to take anything away from Dennis. He's, you know, arguably a Hall of Fame player and, and uh, is, is certainly one of the best money players and one of the biggest hearts, you know, in the game in the last 25 years. But I don't think they're at the same level, to be honest. Okay. Would you would you put Shane at the level of Earl? Close, close. Uh, I don't think I don't think Shane would put himself at the level of Earl. Earl in his prime was a sight to behold. I mean, there was there was nothing like it. Uh, you know, nobody shot like Earl. Uh, Shane has never shot straighter than Earl. Uh, so, um, and and that was at a, a time in the game where breaking was slamming them as hard as you can and not knowing where any balls were going and, and still firing everything in from there. Um, it was a more offensive game then. And uh, I just think, yeah, Earl was, Earl was, you know, just a, to me, a notch, a notch above, but Shane's Shane, you know, over the last 25 years, 20 years in the, in the two thousands, uh, certainly the most dominant player in the U S and one of the most, you know, one of the top, three or four dominant players in the world for sure. Well, I'll just throw in, I don't think that Shane was greater than Earl because you can't take away from Earl and you can't compare across generations necessarily. Right. But I think what, what Shane did from 07 until 2017, um, I think that he dominated more completely against a even more higher level, a deeper level of skill and higher level of skill. Uh, I think what he did with 10 ball uh, was nobody could touch him, which you know, and and he played ten ball the way Earl played nine ball. Uh, the games have changed, so you can't really hold the fact that the rack has changed against him. But I would say that I, I would say that sure, uh, Shane. I wouldn't say he surpassed Earl or anything like that. I just think that he proved himself to be a generational talent, and I think he dominated World Pool for about ten years and raised the bar. And uh, I, I I think he's achieved that level. So anyway, my opinion. Yeah, no, I, I, I will agree with you. You know, generational talent for sure uh, in his generation. Uh, what I would argue with you or, or contest with you is is uh, the quality of the fields. Um, when Earl was in his heyday, it was a pretty standard tour in the U.S. You know, they played a lot of tournaments, 64, and it was all the same players. They had a pretty well put together association. And it was Siegel and it was Varner and it was Buddy Hall and it was Jim Rempe and it was Kim Davenport and it was – Rodney Morris and and you know uh, Ralph was over here and and Thurston and Johnny and so you know when you talk about the years where Earl was dominant uh, there were there were no slouch matches in any of those tournaments in those days. But the the problem is though if you go down to a sixty four to a hundred twenty eight player field you know you go down forty spots or sixty spots or eighty spots and the play 
started dropping off to being, you know, strong regional players and shortstops. Now you go down 80 spots and you've got guys like Oliver and, uh, you know, Bies Kovartunski. And I, I, I just think that, I think that when you look at the, the, the U S open fields with two, you know, 128 and 256 players, uh, that Shane's won, uh, you have to go down real, real far down there before you find guys that aren't turning in real, real, real high level stats. And so I agree that like when you look at the top 10, the top 10 in any field has always been, you know, Hall of Fame worthy. Uh, but it's I, I think that, you know, the top players of yesteryear, it seems like they could get down to the final 16 and then battle it out against other top players. Whereas now it, it, it just feels like from round one, everybody in that field is just completely a killer it's hard to even make the qual- and that we saw that in the world championship how how uh how many top players didn't even make the quarterfinals yeah well as fun. uh anyway as the, it was fun to talk about thank you <laughs> as the regional old guy here so uh <laughs> i was born last week um i don't even know who buddy hall is can you explain <laughs> totally just kidding totally just kidding <laughs> so uh I guess let's go through and let's actually give some predictions on the match. So, uh, Mike, you're the big screen right now, so why don't you start us? What's your uh, prediction on the score? Uh, I will go Shane, and I'll go uh, 107. 120, 107. Rob, what you got? I got Shane Hill Hill. Taking a Shane final Hill. <laughs> <laughs> shocked. I'm shocked. <laughs> Mike, what you got? I'll say Dennis by seven. 120, 113. Demetrius? Can I bet that the table just explodes between the two of them? No, I uh <laughs> You can I, don't, I don't. I don't know. I don't know on this one. I'm really lost at sea. There's so many factors, but I'll, I really like Mike's prediction. I'll piggyback 120 to uh, I'll go 111. Dennis, I'll just. I have no idea what's going to happen though. So. Um, I've been uh, wrong on my last two picks, uh, by the way. I haven't. I wasn't on those podcasts, so I just want to confess I was wrong. <laughs> Sky, Sky beat Dennis on the bar table. Dennis beat Shane on the big table. I've been wrong on those last two, so I'm like, I, at this point, I'm reeling. But I'll, uh, I'll since I got a pick, I'll pick Dennis 120 to 111, and I hope I'm wrong. I hope Shane plays great. Well, you can always predict that the quarter lands on its side. There's that's, statistically a chance. That's right. I want to see it go hill hill again, and I want to see somebody get three fouled. That would be epic. <laughs> oh my! Oh my God! Like, th- I think the I think the like table would blow up if that happened because I'm th- I'm pretty sure whoever got three fouled on the hill would probably just flip it and start <laughs> it on fire. And I want to see I want to see the, I want to see him play a lock up airtight safety on two fouls and then see like the other person like study it for like four minutes make like a bridge over a ball four rail kick make good contact and then billiard into the side pocket. <laughs> Is that, is that horrible to report? <laughs> okay, sorry. You can mute, you can mute me now. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay, um, Nate, what are you? Uh, 120 to 6. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, no, I, I think Dennis, or, uh, I think I think Shane wins pretty comfortably. I, I think it's going to be about 120 to maybe 120, 98. 120, 100, somewhere in that range. Uh, I have to pick a number, so I guess we'll go 99 right in the middle. I, I think Shane gets there. Um, I, I, I think Shane's playing the best version of his game or the best version of what his game can be right now. And uh, I think Dennis is uh, a, a notch below where he was. Not a lot, not a big lot, notch maybe, but an, enough of a notch that um, it's going to make the difference. So that's my prediction. That's everybody's prediction. Let's hear you guys out there in the comments while we wrap up the podcast here. What are your predictions for the match? Let's see what uh, you guys all think it's going to be out there. And I guess, uh, is there anything in the match quickly that you guys are looking for as far as um, trend lines? And I, I'll start this to kind of give you an idea of what I'm asking for here. Uh, I think uh, I think Dennis double dipping Shane kind of gives him that confidence going into the weekend. I'm kind of looking to see if Dennis carries that over and jumps out to a big lead in the beginning and kind of carries that confidence into this match. So that's really what I'm going to be looking for in the beginning of this match, just to kind of see what, what doing, what double dipping Shane does to the beginning of this match, whether it gives Dennis that big jump of confidence to jump out there early, or if Shane comes out fire and knowing that he just got double dipped and it's time to make a statement on this match. Mike, anything Mike Pinoza? Um, well, I always, you know, it's, it's like watching a hockey game. I always look at, you know, 
the, the first five minutes of the period and the last five minutes of the period. And so in a pool match that goes over <laughs> multiple days like this, I, I try to pay attention to who starts out hot and, and who closes with a flourish. Um, you know, I'll just be interested to see whether that carries over from day to day, regardless of, you know, who has that, that flourish. Gotcha. Rob? Uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what kind of play there is nine ball being racked on the spot. I, 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 I saw some differences the last time they did this in a tournament where a lot of the racks were a little bit messy. There wasn't as many break and runs. Uh, they're, even though they're trying to control that, that the one ball and stuff, it still, it didn't seem like anybody got into a pure rhythm on the break. It was, it seemed like the players were fishing around a little bit. And the longer this race is, the more time, of course, they have to do that. And so that, that's what I'm going to be looking at. And, and I think that's going to make a difference. I, I think the break here, uh, and what happens right at the first shot after the break is, is uh, going to be pretty interesting. All right. Demetrius? Yeah, I'll agree with that. I think that the big two things I'm going to be watching for is, first of all, how that break is working. You know, is Dennis able to keep up with Shane on the break? Uh, and, and how big of a role is the break playing? Are either of them able to generate a, a, a ball going in and getting shots and putting big packages together? Or are they both struggling with it? Or does one player have an edge? I think those are the questions. The other thing is um, I'm going to be looking for how Shane handles it when Dennis has the momentum and when Shane is on his back. I think matches like this, the momentum comes and goes. I, I think there's no question Shane, when he's got the momentum, is going to be playing, you know, top level pool. I think what I'm really looking for is when Dennis is fighting back and when things aren't going Shane's way, it does he leak back a few games or does he does he leak off a bunch of games? And and is he you know, is he ready to grit it and fight it to turn things around when he's, you know, in the dirt? Or is he just kind of waiting for it to turn around and irritable and waiting for things to go his way? So I again I think it's going to come down to how big of a role is the break playing. Who's breaking better? How is that? You know, is there a breaking edge? And then how well is Shane doing when things aren't going his way? That's it. And Mike? Yeah, I think I'm with Demetrius. Uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how the, the ebbs and flows go and, you know, the, the packages that they put together and, and, and how they, they transition back and forth. Um, that was something that really jumped out at me and Dennis and Sky, and I realized that we're not going to see packages like that. But uh, that's kind of what I'm going to be watching for. Gotcha. All right. Well, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, Ben said, uh, I'm excited to see the Omega production. Yeah. We can give him a shout out to Mike Ong, who's, uh, I guess done quite a bit for getting these big matchups together for us fans at home. So a uh, big shout out to him with uh, Omega billiards for uh, putting all these things together. And, I guess with that, that's that's everything on my uh, resume as far as wanting to get everything uh, out for today. So anybody else have anything that they want to discuss before we get moving? All good. You know, it's been a while since I've been on here, so I just want to plug my boot camps. Uh, for any new listeners that don't know, um, I'm here in Minnesota, but I've got uh, – I'm running three-day pool boot camps for, uh, for serious pool players. Uh, so check out my website at MN, like Minnesota, poolbootcamp.com. Uh, can you link that, Nate? Is there a way you can link the website? I don't know. Anyway, yeah. uh, I'd love for some people to uh, look me up. Uh, if you've uh, if you've been playing for a while and you play well and you're trying to figure out how to break through to the next level, give me a call. Let's talk about it. I might be able to help you over the phone, and uh, there's a chance that we could even get together and uh, put in a three-day training session. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, let's uh, I guess let's close out for another week. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. Mike Thank Howerton, you. Mike Pinozo, Demetrius, Rob. Thanks, guys. Yes, sir. Thank you. And, Rob, if you need a new car, man, let me know. I've got a 1987. Uh, it's, it looks like new. Looks like new. <laughs> I've right. driven to, only driven to church and back. That's right. All right, boys. Yeah. I'll see you next time. <laughs> All right. Take well, care, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. See you, sports fans. Hey everyone, thanks again for listening. If you've liked what you've heard and you want to contribute to the future content that will be made, consider joining the podcast's Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash queue it up.
Becoming a Patreon of the podcast will help to create all of the future content that the podcast will have. Special shout out to Dave Peters, Aaron Taylor, Pete Silsby, Morgan Lupton, Ben Young, Robert Miller, Andy Morse, and Bill Pelham for your generous contributions to the podcast's Patreon. If you ever need any more information on what the Patreon system is or how you can contribute outside of the Patreon, please reach out to the podcast or Nate himself. If you would like to contribute to the podcast for free, consider sharing any podcasts or the podcast page on Facebook itself. Also, leaving a review and a rating if you listen through iTunes. It helps others find the podcast. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back soon with another episode of the Cue It Up podcast.